Hello, I'm Emma Green and welcome to the Virtual Engineering Centre podcast, Engineering in Digital. The idea of smart cities has been around for a long time. Thought to use technology to increase operational efficiency, share information with the public and improve both the quality of government services and citizen welfare. In 1974, Los Angeles created the first urban big data project. 20 years later, in 1994, Amsterdam created the first virtual digital city. And in 2008, IBM Smart Planet project investigated how sensors and networks can be applied to urban issues. Fast forward to 2018, where London updates initial 2013 plans with a launch of Smarter London Together, a roadmap to London's become the smartest city in the world. Fast forward today in 2022 and what has actually been put in place and are smart cities still all the range? I'm joined today by IoT experts Thomas Kendall and project engineer Matthew Elt from the Virtual Engineering Centre to discuss all things smart cities and where the plans are up to. So as our expert, can you tell us exactly what is meant by a smart city? Well, that's a difficult question in itself, Emma, because being told exactly what a smart city is, I think, is an impossible question. I don't think there is an exact definition of a smart city. I think people, like with a lot of technological buzzwords, think to what they've seen on TV, maybe like flying cars and like cities that all interact with us and everything's neon and it's going to be like 20 years in the future and it's going to be like a city that you don't have to do anything things will just happen around you (laughs) it's a smart city um whereas that is just not the case and i don't think there is a definition per se that is agreed with across industry but i would say a smart city refers to the use of digital technologies and data to improve the place that we live in um i think really that also includes calling it maybe a connected city maybe an easier way to understand it. I think the word smart kind of sends people off on tangents, but if we think about it more as a connected place or connected places, then we're probably at a better starting point. Yeah, Yeah, because it it kind of, especially a couple of years ago, it was kind of, it was everywhere, wasn't it? Or like trade magazine, like you couldn't read an article without smart cities being brought into it. Yeah, absolutely. And, And, you know, there's... It's, it's even difficult because the outcomes are so varied as well. If we think of a smart city as trying to be a place that is improved for social benefit or economic benefit or environmental benefit, and all of those three things look different, but they're all included under the smart city umbrella, then you know this is why it pops up everywhere. Environmental report, smart cities, or like, you know, <laughs> yeah. healthcare report, smart cities. Um, and this is the challenge, like, A smart city in itself is built of other smart areas of industry. So if we talk about manufacturing or smart buildings, smart transport, smart people, like in the sense that not just intelligent, but people with good digital skills, um, would probably be classed as smart people. So yeah, smart city, difficult term to to quantify. Because uh, could you even, I don't know, differentiate a smart city and a near to smart city like how do you examine and rate percentage wise because you could say like you said you've got all these different technologies that all supposedly play a role into making somewhere a smart city but is there certain like boxes that need to be ticked in order for it to technically classify as a smart city so you can have like you said if you have air pollution sensors and you collect a, a number of environmental data and then it's seen classed as a smart city because of that but then it's not got maybe some of the other elements mm-hmm. so where like where's the line what cl- like classifies it oh, i don't i mean there is a line of if you're probably doing something in this day and age you're probably classing yourself as a smart city and so forth unless you're doing nothing you're probably yeah. somewhere <laughs> on the spectrum of doing smart city stuff um and a lot of cities are further ahead than others but the, as you said this is where it's different how do you draw the line if someone is focused on air pollution but somebody is otherwise looking at healthcare? but they're both smart cities but they're very different scales yes. and so i think as long as there is action or a plan of action 
to include digital technologies to improve something that is going on in the city, you're probably, that is the line. Um, and then when we originally talked about IoT last series, where it's adoption isn't necessarily doing, it could be planning to do. And I think yeah. a lot of that is where smart city theory is kind of where it's at at the moment. There's a lot of plans, perhaps not as much action that's necessarily expected. But if you're planning to do it, you're probably somewhere on your smart city journey as it were. But again, where that line is, that's very difficult. I think if you're doing something, you're over the line. <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> How do you judge who's doing it best? That is, that's yeah, difficult. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's almost impossible really, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. There's it's just too many variables. Um, so I mean, so someone has it, because there's articles out there of going, what are the smartest cities in the world? And obviously somebody's quantified it under something or other, but whether that's correct is, you know, it's a yeah. question. Yeah. What are the key examples of cities, existing cities, um, that are kind of working and using these technologies? I mean, there are several cities in the UK, so close to home. You know, I live in Manchester, our area of work is like Liverpool region, both are doing smart city things. Um, so even if you look at like basic levels, um, I'll get I'll let Matt talk about Liverpool because that's where he is. But you know, in Manchester there was rollouts um, on the Oxford Road corridor. It was called City Verve, which was like an IoT, um, yeah, demonstrator almost in smart city. Um, which I think the trial has ended now, but was quite successful. So that was you know sensors on lampposts. That was smart transportation for buses and pedestrianising and yeah energy usage um, and lots of bits which you know is happening right on my doorstep in Manchester um, and even from a personal point of view when I go and get the tram I can see when it's arriving on my phone and when it's there and I can see routes and live updates and you know all of this is smart city stuff um, you know London obviously has its own plans and I think we'll come on to that um, of their previous plans and Maybe moving forwards um, but you know all over the world New York apparently this is you know this is where it's just the things I've read but every fire hydrant in New York has is sensed so they can judge when they're being used or if there's leaks and like something like 800,000 fire hydrants or something you know that's a smart city idea yeah. um, so you know like everywhere uh, and you know I think Hull is another one and probably Birmingham and you know think of a big place in the UK is probably doing something smart city one. I don't know what do you think of what's happening in Liverpool Matt? Um, I was just wondering about your definition of a smart person and whether I would um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> do you pass the test? <laughs> if, if, you're, if your definition of a smart person is as loose as your definition of a smart city then I really hope I qualify. <laughs> yeah I think, I think you do I'll give you that. Good thank you. Um, but yeah Liverpool's uh, pretty similar to um, to, to Manchester, I think the uh, yeah bus timetables and all that um, apps for for that. Uh, you've got the bikes, you've got the uh, the scooters, the Voy scooters. Although yeah, yeah they're pretty handy. Um, I suppose we've all got Uber as well, all yeah. around the world, um, mm. where you can track and trace where your um, driver is, where they're coming up to, where they've gone, and then all the data information that comes with the driver as well. Um, improving safety and things like that for both driver and passenger. Mm-hmm. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And it can look a lot lighter as well. I think, you know, you look at Amsterdam. So, you know, Matt, you mentioned the scooters and in Manchester, we've got some kind of bikes as well. Hopefully they won't all get nicked this time. That was an issue last time. Um, but, you know, in Amsterdam, it's a lot of it's around green transportation. They cycle a lot. It's about planning cycle routes and like having digital maps of the city so you can get around and that was more their focus of you know encouraging what people do and giving a lot of people the tools to benefit from that was their smart city vision rather than perhaps sensing everything so again that you know completely different but still classes um you know isn't there a statistic around amsterdam that there's actually more bikes than people something like that yeah um, but i mean based on a long history of discussions and planning what has happened to s- smart cities because yeah as i said it was a, it was a massive um a massive jargon it was used all the time and now it seems to have 
like calm down a little but then now we've got um areas of conversation such as net carbon zero um so do you think this whole smart cities will kind of kick off again um now that we've got obviously an environmental focus and we are now have tools are in a position to really hone in on those ideas um yeah i think it's really um opened up the conversation about um like efficiency and and, and what we can use these dig- digital technologies for um it, we've been given this kind of direct target and purpose to be carbon zero by whatever year it is um and uh yeah so i think that that's a big bullseye for everyone to uh, to aim for um got all of these kind of initiatives to do with waste management and recycling and um what was the what was the phrase about um one second circular economy yeah yeah um, yeah, yeah yeah just making sure that we kind of reuse and repair and recycle things so they go back into the um the economy and we're not just throwing them away um and i think that you know smart city connections um tracking all of this stuff can can really feed back that information to to tell us how we're doing it how we're doing poorly uh, and then what areas we can focus on to improve so i see a, a smart city kind of um as a city which is putting uh, effort into feeding back information into what it's trying to achieve um so if you're if you're focusing on transport you might be feeding back in traffic information and uh, and then you know you, you know where your problems are then um and you can redirect and you can remanage it uh, and if you're looking at kind of healthcare around say a city region you'd say okay well the population is suffering uh, these types of conditions more heavily than uh, the the background um, average for, for the country. So uh, perhaps that's something that we're doing wrong here. Perhaps that's some kind of um, policy decision that we can we can change. Uh, maybe local government, or maybe there's some you know some some reason. Maybe there's um, issues about food supply, um, food quality in certain areas. Uh, and I know that we've, we've done a project to do with um, quantifying how well supplied different areas of Liverpool are with uh, good quality food. Um, yeah, so um, it's all about kind of feeding back information to allow people to improve. So, Yeah, I, th- I think that's a really important and um, really important point to make because it's, yeah, it's a smart city. It's all about collecting data. It's all about the types of data that you want to collect, but ultimately it's the purpose of it it's what is your objective with the data how can the data be used and what change is it going to drive and mm-hmm. um, so like you've mentioned the food systems uh, case study that we did alongside uh, the university of liverpool um was kind of creating a platform a digital tool and platform and interface that then communicated clearly quite clearly and visually the different ta- areas of liverpool city region um, down to the neighbourhoods and then introduced a lot of different data such as like bus times, bus travel routes, um, you know, the average income of these households within these different neighbourhoods and then like working hours when they would typically suggest to when they would typically do their like food shopping and things like that. And then in comparison, looking at numbers of shops within the region that they live or work and then their opening hours, the types of shops. So you know, a, su- a huge supermarket, Tesco supermarket is going to have fruit and veg and you're likely to have a good availability, good stock levels of fruit and veg. Whereas, you know, there's some areas where they've only got a bargain booze and it's a convenience store that you can go and get alcohol and crisps or unhealth, like less healthy options. So then it generates a type of like lifestyle for those people within that community that haven't got easier access to healthy foods. But then again, it's it's all good having that data and being able to show it. But then, yeah, it's who then takes that data and then convinces, identifies the areas of change and convinces and drives that change forward to improve the lives um, and health and lifestyles of those residents and the area as a whole, really. So, but that data can be expanded thousands of ways, couldn't it? You could you could drop as much data in that as possible. You could change the whole purpose of it, what you're communicating, what mm. areas 
trying to change and things like that. So it is it's really, really interesting. And uh, just using that one case study as an example. Yeah, and like you, you touched upon almost the most important thing about the smart city is who is it benefiting? Like it's got to benefit someone. Yeah. And, and all these technology things that we talk about, there's no point in doing it if there isn't a benefit and especially if there isn't a benefit to the people who live in the cities that are becoming smart. Um, so like the food food mapping food systems project that we did was interesting in that because it is to try and improve the lives of people in the transportation and it may just be to make people's lives more efficient or I suppose net carbon net zero is pretty important for us all because it's, it's our planet that we live on. <laughs> it may be secondary that it benefits us because it benefits the planet and therefore it benefits us. But it is there is a benefit to doing yes. it. If there isn't that, then it's a waste. And kind of, you know, your question around what, what happened to smart cities, like, as we said, there was a big buzz around them. Yeah. And then they haven't gone anywhere. Like, as we said, there's been pilots and you're just giving loads of examples on, on things that could be classed as smart city projects that have been happening. But I think it was that expectation that cities would just explode into smart cities overnight. And that's just not the case because there's a lot of challenges um, yes. in the way. You know, you've got, number one, it's, it's a financial burden. If we're putting sensors on things and storing data, um, you know, it takes a lot of investment. And, you know, we talk about London. I think that was part of the issue of what happened there's a 2018 think about it COVID has come investment hasn't been there so therefore it hasn't moved on as much as people would have thought it's still there it's just yeah. you know, it's, it's, it's going to take a bit longer than probably what people expected and it's this combination as well between it's not just the councils doing it or the government it's private industry and governments having to work together and people having to work together and all those things are challenges it's not just one party doing things it requires everybody to work together from many different industries to make smart cities a reality and that is probably why they haven't come to the point <laughs> that we would expect them to be um it's a slow burn but things things are happening I mean, there's very interesting things happening but yeah i suppose that the boom and the buzz has slightly dissipated but i don't think that's necessarily a bad thing because things can go on behind the scenes and a bit more under the radar without the pressure of people's thoughts on them yeah and like we said at the very very beginning if there's no exact definition is how do you measure a smart city like mm. like i said what boxes have been ticked is there a minimal boxes that need to be ticked for it to be classed as a smart city and um, and with so much data now in our social like we've talked about this on the podcast and um, data being collected on social life business and everything else that there's abundant of data everywhere at the moment um so you would kind of think that a lot of it is already there and like elements are already in cities like amsterdam with smart maps and things like that um so there's a it's not like everyone's starting from scratch there's already a lot of elements existing already um so m like moving forward and looking into the future how do we think things like 5g are really gonna accelerate smart cities and then becoming much more of a reality i mean yeah well, 5g is going to be important for so many different areas of the digital world they're in because it's it's a facilitator i think mostly yeah. like the communications that we use and smart cities being based around data 5g over 4g allows us to collect more data and quicker than we previously have been able to do so you know if we're thinking that billions of devices are going to have to be installed or used across cities all across the country and across the world to make smart cities more of a reality they're going to have to communicate with each other and that's a lot of infrastructure that needs to be in place to to make that happen and 5g makes that happen you know more data mm. quicker and it opens up possibilities that wouldn't have been able to happen 10 years ago because you just can't move things quick enough um you know we can even tell it like if you look at games all the like streaming videos and stuff of well they used to lag or you have to used to boot your parents off um <laughs> the phone line to, <laughs> to even download a web page and now you can stream multiple 4k videos yeah um, and watching things and that's because of improvements to like internet and wired internet but now going to be moved into more like wireless communications and that's really exciting and it's going to 
I suppose being a part of the smart city infrastructure, 5G being all over cities, it's the facilitator to make all that happen. Um, and it's got, you know, it's going to have massive benefits and improvements, but it's going to also have, you know, realistically it will increase power, speed and reach. But the more that we look into smart cities and, and have these data issues, there's both technical and social aspects that will impact this. And now, as we talked about in a podcast previously around the social aspect of connectivity, um, you know, the social aspects of smart cities or our personal aspect, our personal relationship with our data and the data is collected on us is going to be a big issue in smart cities as well. Um, Because, you know, a lot of it is data on people, it's data on movement, it's data on things that we do, the transport that we use. It may come from our devices, it may not. It may come from cameras and video. And I think that's going to be a stumbling block. So although technologies are going to make it possible, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's then just going to happen because other things will stand in the way that aren't technological issues, that are more social issues or, you know, yeah. Yeah. Um, the I think that's really important. Um, the idea that um, social issues are going to come in, in the way here is because um, all of the projects that I've looked at to do with smart cities, which come under that umbrella, they tend to be bridging the gap between the public and private sector. Who's going to who's going to handle that data? And um, if you've got 5G sensors and, and uh, data streaming from people's phones to inform this smart city project, then it's going through a private company where the data is being collected potentially or with that owns the infrastructure and then it's going to say a public sector organization um, which is then going to process this data and inform uh, policy or, or whatever's going to whatever the project's part of um, then you know you've got that potentially personal data going through two different organizations and it's got the handover where's that data can be stored and just get some people's heads um, and like you said Tom about the the difficulty of setting all that up um it's got to have good communication between public and private sector i think that the as smart cities develop it's it's going to be at the pace that these relationships between the public and private sector develop um that will be the limiting factor and and those those kind of projects which bridge that gap you know healthcare is a big one it's nhs and any company that they work with which um which collects data and they might be one of the companies that is um that relationship might be a pioneering relationship because they've already got quite a good model for this because the public and private sector have been meeting at the nhs for years and years and years and that struggle has always been real as we know from you know funding it um and and yeah that that's going to become a big thing with you know net carbon zero and, and all of that because these companies got to work together with the government to, yeah. to achieve those targets um, and of course transport city planning um, and uh, mental health becoming a big thing as well we'll see yeah and it you know on top of that talking technologies can make it happen but there will be issues it also needs to be profitable so when we're talking about private industry getting involved with this and as well as government bodies it's all well and good saying we can do all these things but actually, if there isn't, if the investment doesn't have a return for those who are investing in it, it it's not going to move at the same pace that you would want it to either. And there's going to be a conflict there, and especially when it comes to data, of how you use that data, do you gain money from the data that you're collecting? And it's, it, there's going to be battles behind the scenes of, you know, profitability and things that make technological advancement difficult <laughs> um, yeah. when people are involved. So it's going to be interesting well that was what i was actually going to ask as well because where we're talking about companies making the investments but then private and public and how it's going to work is who owns that data and then who is signing over who's signing over that data and for what purposes and yet can it is it multi-purpose what else will that data be used for beyond the benefit of the people it's maybe sold to Mm. i'd kind of like to see a um a, a data broker in the middle there just um a company which might understand all of the law around these things around the data handling be able to communicate with both um public and private sector as an intermediary maybe have the responsibility of storing the data 
um, and uh, anonymizing it maybe. Um, yeah. That might be something that could really facilitate this. And you know, like iPhones, I think we talked about this um, again, like off off the podcast about uh, South Park episode where it's like Apple has sent you these massive terms and conditions <laughs> and no one reads it. We all just click accept. But then it's a case of the consequence of not reading it and all just going, yeah, allow cookies, accept this, accept that, is then you can't. Where's the argument then for when people do use your data or use your data to target you or put you in a group that they then target when you've actually signed your data over? So, yeah, maybe the data, that's an interesting thing about the data broker who would then protect users and the sources of data, maybe. Mm. Yeah, they could be a very powerful organization. <laughs> um, again, yeah. you know, probably not a private organization. That would probably yeah, to maybe it would be an ONS Charitable kind of foundation. spin off or yeah. something. Yeah. Um, but I'd like to see, like you said, I, I, I agree that we all just click through it. And actually, it's become such a norm that I think the the idea of someone feeling guilty for not reading through it has just yeah. gone away. Like everyone does it. Um, so I, I kind of think we need to do better with it. I think that possibly the, mm-hmm. needs to tighten up the laws about what you can and can't do with data, and then not allow company. And then and then you can you can get rid of this um, constant pop up every time I visit a web page that says, "Do you want to allow cookies? You're not allowed to do anything until you click yes or no." <laughs> Noise yeah. me endlessly. So it is estimated that by 2030, the number of cities in the world with a population of more than 10 million will grow to 43. And then by 2050, up to 70% of the world's population is expected to live in cities. So the question is, how can smart cities help us to manage this growth and um, weight on resources, including, as you mentioned, Tom, the planet as a whole? Because we're all on this planet. We all need it to survive. We need it to do well. Um, but obviously growing population is having a massive impact on it um, hence why like net carbon zero and policies similar policies are kind of coming in and are really being pushed by all cylinders um, so how can a smart city help us support that yeah I mean it's a very big question with a lot of answers <laughs> um, I mean if we, on a basic level if we think about it the more real-time data that we can capture about a city and the people in it so vehicles energy water waste like everything if we can use that to make decisions and model things better as we grow then that that will have an impact on how we grow and how our cities grow so if we can model how people move around a city then as that population grows and we need to build more roads or buildings, we can make better decisions on where they are and manage that growth in a much better way. Or, you know, where does the waste go? A big, big problem in London over the last 10, 20 years is you build everything, but you don't update the sewer system. Yeah. Like, where does it go? Like, it, it can't support <laughs> the amount of, it can't support the amount, they just dug a, I mean, <laughs> to put this in the politest way, they have decided just to dig a very big hole <laughs> to um, store it before it gets moved out at times and it's it's just it's planning not based on appropriate data um, so actually the smart city concept if we have that data the decisions that we make can be good and can be right for growing cities it doesn't mean that cities have to be bad like we can make them better that the bit the more people arrive whether that is logistics or transport or food yeah you know um we can make better decisions ultimately um, and they can be yeah around those things or you know pollution um yeah like control of, of, of vehicles and like net carbon zero and, and just yeah pollution in general most people with risk like someone that me and matt quite often speak to um quite often gives us a fact around most people with respiratory illnesses live in cities and the more people you bring in to those cities the more people that are going to have respiratory illnesses if we leave things as they are um so you know that whole dealing with pollution or 
green transport, whether it's electric cars or, or, or less, pedestrianising areas, not letting cars drive in certain places because you're sensing pollution levels should yeah. have a positive impact on the general health of the population. But again, that's making decisions based on data that you collect now, how a city functions currently, so you can make better decisions on how to develop it as you move down the road. That makes sense. Yeah, um, I think that the um, the term um, smart city, for me, it's not, it, it's, it's, we're kind of using it like it's a project and using it to say that, oh, a smart city should be, x or y but really it's just connected like like you've both been saying um so it's almost like a platform for projects so it depends what what projects are being applied in the city like you were talking about tom with um all of those green projects um and how we can improve through there so i mean you could have a smart city that's absolutely terrible for the environment um it just depends on what projects are being run but mm. um but yeah i read a fantastic um example uh, about Singapore um, and they modelled their city um, in a kind of like a 3D model of the city and then they did a, a wind model so they could see how the wind direction uh, what, and the wind the airflow was travelling through the city and Singapore you know quite quite hot a lot of a lot of houses have air conditioners um, especially on during the night so anything that they could do the city planners could do to reduce the amount of energy used for air conditioners during the night uh, was a good thing so increasing the airflow through the city cools the city down um, reduces the energy used in air air conditioners and i thought that's such a fantastic example of um, reducing your energy costs for for the city uh, and it's such a good example of you know connected data because we're looking at um, metering the energy used for these places so we know what areas are bad what areas are good and then of course doing kind of smart technology um, or s smart models by scanning and modeling the the city and then um, fluid fluid modeling of, of the air tra traveling through the city so you know you can plan where your buildings are going to go you can plan how they're set up what shape they are and uh, architects are uh, you know if everyone's kind of aligned and, and we're all making a smart city and designing a smart city then why not optimize that for energy usage in that particular way um, so I thought that was just a really good example to bring up about kind of reducing our energy consumption and uh, bringing up the idea of metering and, and feeding back that information into whatever projects that the smart city is then facilitating yeah, I, th I think that's a really good point, Matt, about um, just because it's a smart city doesn't mean it's environmentally better um, or healthier than any other city. It's just maybe you've just got more data. Same as like lockdown when we were all stuck, stuck at home, it wasn't ideal. But the environmental impacts like Venice or Swans come back and it's little things like that where we th we didn't think we'd see certain things happen again. But then it has happened do you remember that town in Wales where all the sheep took over? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like a horror film. Yeah. <laughs> um, so going up, we'll ask you this one. Um, what exactly is meant by a sustainable building and circular economy models that pre that are predicted to be key as part of smart city development? Oh, great. Uh, circular economy. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, so circular economy basically is just um, it's a model of, of production and consumption, which um, involves sharing, leasing, reusing, repairing, refurbishing, recycling um, your materials and your products as long as possible so that you're reducing um, waste. Um, you know, you're, you're making your city more work more efficiently um, and reducing the load on on those services, which then aren't um feeding back into the the circular economy um so that's generally just i guess a definition <laughs> but of course you can see how the uh, connected and smart cities would would feed back into that because if you can measure it then that immediately yeah. you start to think about it if you can create data around it so um, i I was reading somewhere that um, London and uh, some of these other smart cities have been putting monitors on bins. Um, so that's, you know, keeping track of um, your waste. And and uh, I think if people realise that we're monitoring it, 
then they start to think about it a bit more. Um, if you can start to think about, if, if you know how much your your waste, how much you're wasting effectively, and yeah. how much you're recycling, um, you you effectively had your head pulled out of the sand. You have to you have to do something about it. Otherwise, you know, the psychology is, I know that I'm wasting a lot because I can see the numbers. Um, yeah. Therefore, if I don't do anything about this, then I'm going to feel bad about myself because you know, I'm wasting things. So the more we can kind of bring attention to it, we're going to automatically start that process of improvement. And especially if we've got people way ahead of the game who are um, talking about the circular economy and trying to uh, reinvigorate um, and reuse uh, and, and start up you know, projects which um, reduce our waste. But yeah, this is exactly what we're doing when we're capturing data. Um, and presenting it we're, we're saying we're bad at this and here are the numbers here are the facts you can't ignore it you can't say oh well you know i recycle this much and that's pretty that's pretty pretty good you know well now we know you're not recycling enough and and you should yeah. do more and and this is the average and this is what you do and you know how how do you resolve your self-image with regard to this data um so that's the question we're constantly asking ourselves and others when we capture the data and present it so uh so yeah i think that's just a massively positive thing for for cities <laughs> especially if we're we're looking to hit these kind of key targets in the future yeah you, obviously you guys um speak with businesses and um, scope projects with them talk about their challenges and identify solutions to them um have you came across any businesses where maybe they you know maybe thought one thing you've you guys have collected and demonstrated the data back to them and maybe it's not necessarily about energy consumption but maybe energy consumption uh, maybe like stock levels or mismanagement of information or has there ever been a time where you've like communicated the data back and put it maybe into more context that it's surprised or shocked businesses and um, and maybe driven them to change something uh well we've got a project on at the moment which um it's about it's a connected device um which is sending data potentially to the cloud um and it's going to be collecting quite a lot of data and generating it um and we've had a lot of discussions about how en energy efficient we can make it, about whether um, sending it to a cloud server, um, an independently owned cloud server, um, potentially in America. We don't, you know, we don't know where these things would be hosted. You know, probably not, but um, it's a it's potential. Um, whether that would be more or less energy efficient than, say, creating your own set of servers, hosting them yourself, um, and um, and the whole idea of how much energy that would use. I know me and Tom put quite a lot of effort into thinking about it um, and researching. And um, there's certain things that these big cloud companies do, which makes them very efficient and very cost effective for them to save energy. Um, so like operating at night, the energy costs are lower. Um, so there's less energy on the grid, so they can be more efficient with with how they, how they run things, you know, less load on the servers, um the the um energy requirements for cooling them goes down and um and and this kind of thing um and and you've got the the whole idea of um big batches make more efficiency so if, if you've got a whole farm of servers um you're probably cooling them much more efficiently um than uh, someone who's got some here and then another company's got some here and another company's got some here but they've only got one or two so maybe they're not doing the most efficient um, solution um, so yes yeah, so we've been looking into that a bit and actually we were really pleased um, and I was a bit surprised at how energy conscious the um, the owner but well, this particular SME was um, with regards to the project so that's i hope that's a good example uh tom i don't know if you can think of any more but yeah i mean there's another yeah. project we're working on isn't there um the rather large manufacturing company around energy efficiency savings and they're although we're still doing the project so therefore we haven't quite told them the things that might blow their mind uh, again they're very aware um of 
the requirement to be energy efficient and actually asking what they can do to be so what kind of things they can put in place or you know especially like in, in a process driven company of how do we do things better with an eye purely on environmental savings um you know this isn't a profit driven thing necessarily it's not you know increased throughput this is a purely energy efficiency um saving project um so again hopefully some interesting data will come out of that um where we can go oh actually you know you're doing it this way but if you changed it mm -hmm. to do it this way which is kind of counter thought to what you're currently doing you know you could save this much energy um you know, through, through some of the stuff we do at the VC with like process planning and um, yeah, factory simulation and, and stuff like that, we can help work out those and, you know, data analytics into large energy data sets. Um, you know, again, we'll hopefully be able to start answering some of those questions for these small and large companies because um, it's a focus for everyone. And as Matt said, the company that we're working with, it was a pleasant surprise that, you know, energy is as important as price there like it, is, yeah. it really is a thinking um so yeah um, i think we'll see more of it i don't i think for a lot of small manufacturers energy isn't the most important thing right now to them as long as they can keep going and making a profit perhaps energy isn't the main you know worry as it were yeah. but i think the more and more the years and months will go on we'll have more clients will be far more aware of energy usage and energy savings and it's something i see us doing more of yeah i've actually been very surprised by the amount of people that have have said it have mm. said we want to do this in an energy efficient way and i'm thinking okay this is great um but yeah that project you were talking about the big the, that big big company um they effectively wanted to have you know they wanted to meter their energy usage a lot better and then present it to the workers um mm who were doing the, the, the tasks with the, the machinery. Um, I think that that's exactly feeds into what we were talking about earlier about the uh, just feedback of how much energy you're using. Because I think the uh, the team that have commissioned this project were looking at energy, as it, were employed to look at energy e efficiency. Um, and I think they were wanting to um, embed it into their colleagues' heads that you're using too much energy when you don't, think about this um yeah. so just presenting it to them was was there um w was what they wanted but yes <laughs> <laughs> this is kind of moving away from smart cities now isn't it this is into everything but it, it's all included yeah. yeah well that's what i was going to say as well do you think that maybe like before lockdown and covid there was like the big buzz around smart cities and then now the focus for smaller businesses and many businesses anyway across the world it is kind of like we've kind of knocked back and you know that's not the front mind, front of our minds at the moment it's more about survival and changing the whole way and process that we work and now it's kind of like okay we actually during that lockdown saw that the um, environmental benefits and some of the economical benefits because of that you know like um, some businesses are, so, are selling their factories or they're selling workspace that they no longer need because people are working from home and they've realized well actually we can benefit financially from not having to pay rent on this place and the electricity bill on this place and this place um, so they're getting rid of those but then also that you can see that happening and those changes and shifts taking place and then it kind of makes you realize well actually if it goes more into a smart city the attitude's more positive towards it because you start to see already see the benefits of mm. becoming more digital and connected that way um so then yeah maybe manufacturers and other companies are starting to see more realistically how it is actually taking place already rather than just the environmental purposes but at the same time because we have net carbon zero and other things that the attitudes and aware just the awareness is the first point isn't it of just yeah. being aware of their own energy consumption and then driving the change like you said Matt with the teams and proving this is like it is doable we can reduce the amount of energy and sometimes it is financially beneficial so it's a bonus if it is I guess um yeah it's just interesting again like yeah how it's 
it was all before COVID. Now it's kind of took a back seat. But then there's other things that are coming to the forefront of people's minds and focus, which maybe will pick up the smart cities again as a buzzword um, as we move forward. Yeah, and it's, it's something that everyone's going to be a part of. So although at the moment those SMEs and manufacturing businesses may not feel like it's a priority for them, eventually it's going to be forced upon them whether they like it or not. You know, you're saying yeah. that cities are going to grow massively and these companies are going to be part of that's those cities so you know use an example of a company's become too big for their premises but in the future space is going to be at a premium if the cities are expanding this much and we need to really think about how we're putting cities together just moving is might not be an option so it's how do you better use the space that you're in or how do you make efficiency improvements to the place that you're in like yeah. at the moment um, you know, in other ways, it's going to affect them that smart cities, and as we said at the beginning, includes people. So as we upskill people and digital people, they're going to be working for these companies and they need to expect the kind of stuff that they're going to get in and the skills that they're going to have is going to change as part of these smart developments. You know, we go all the way back to London um, and they part of their thing was upskilling population and digital skills. That is part of their smart city plan. So actually, yeah. it is these people who are going to be working for the companies and the businesses and going to bring in ideas of their own. And actually, are people going to want to work for a company that isn't thinking about the environment and isn't thinking about these things? Are they going to be become fossilized in a world of, you know, energy conscious eco engineer warriors that might be coming out of, <laughs> you know, these smart city projects? I um, want to change my job title. Engineer yeah, warrior. Engineer eco warrior. All right. Um, <laughs> And then even, a, again, a different aspect. So circular economy, zero waste. A lot of these companies are going to be providing the materials or the products that are used in these smart cities. So actually, there may be big changes to what they're making. So like terrifying statistics around of the amount of things that can be recycled when a building is demolished. Like it's really low. Like how much stuff actually gets reused or, you know, even in our wall insulation there's chemicals in it that we can't redo things so actually companies even making windows or building frames or bicycles or cars or bits for trains if we think that everything is heading towards zero waste as part of the smart city initiative then the things that people are making what they're making them out of how it's reused at the end of its life all come into it so you yeah. know a lot of our clients will be part of that journey and people might stop buying their things if they don't change. So <laughs> there's a lot of ways in which this can affect the companies we work with that are perhaps not obvious now because it's just a little bit on the horizon, but it may sneak up more than, like quicker than people might expect and, and you know, either make or break businesses um, in terms of their eco footprint, especially thinking of smart cities. They need to be a part of the change, not resist it. Um, I think it would be very helpful. Yeah, that's a nice little phrase, isn't it? Be part of the change and not the resistance. Mm. <laughs> like Star Wars. Um, <laughs> you sound like Obama. And, yeah, I mean, even to, <laughs> go on, if you, even to add to that, so like logistics of companies. So Ellen MacArthur Foundation, um, big uh, circular economy um, foundation, say 2 to 5% of global GDP is lost due to congestion. So if we're improving the roads around the cities and things can move easier, then companies can get the stock in and get their products out easier and GDP is increased. So smart cities even just have a knock-on effect to the amount of money that companies might make um, and their resource consumption. And, you know, as a knock-on effect if you're traveling or being able to travel more effectively, you're reducing your knock-on pollutions to the world of what you're using when you're shipping goods and it all just it, like, it keeps coming back in and this is why it's so interesting that we're saying this smart cities is so broad because it is but there's so many different ways into it um especially for companies that we work with that it will have knock-on effects too yeah um and then i was, just, I was actually going to end on uh, the last question is kind of and um, so we currently the VEC currently lead on LCR for Holistic, which is all about connectivity and networks mm -hmm. and developing um, digital 
supply chain ecosystems across like Liverpool City region. So how do you guys envision um, smart cities and smart city technology in really helping to improve that transparency and connectivity across supply chains for cities and other like international supply chains, national supply chains, um, and how they could also help potentially overcome some of the barriers and challenges that we've seen recently with supply chains? Another really loaded question. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot to that one. <laughs> uh, yeah, there is, isn't there? Um, hmm. Yeah, I mean, even on the surface of it, like how companies work together. Supply, so the very simplest supply chain. If a product goes, is made in one company, and has to be transported to another company to be part of another product. Okay, then knowing when a company is going to need a product, like supply chain transparency, maybe like you know these things have been around for decades of just in time and pulling things up the supply chain, but hasn't reached a lot of businesses still. But if you know when a company is going to need something, you don't have to store as much. Therefore, you don't have to have as much wasted space in your factory before you send it on to somebody else and that saves space and storage and lighting costs and heating and everything else um so like supply chains just being able to see push and pull demand for things and when they're going to need them and and that go all the way along like massively reduces waste and both time and money and energy and um, so yeah the supply chain but that's just like you know very specific to manufacturing but works in a lot of other areas like forward face like customer facing companies are going to have change the way they do things because of the data that they have or like planning things on demand like i was thinking about this last night you know smart city if we know population movement around the city i live next to a football stadium and next to that football stadium is a mcdonald's right so if mcdonald's know when the games are and how many people are going to be there and how many walk past their mcdonald's afterwards could they start preparing and getting in the right amount of burgers that people would uh, need to eat after the game right or other takeaway providers are available we can't be biased can we um, <laughs> but you know it's the sharing of that data and it would could be real data knowing where people are and the movement of people and then companies can plan all right we're going to have a lot of people coming in this day so we need more stuff or yeah. we don't have a lot of people coming in at the moment it's quiet season so we don't need as much stuff and it reduces waste or you know you don't need as many staff on or, you know the decisions that you make not necessarily in a manufacturing sense but in a staffing sense or you know the products that you're releasing or when you do things can all be based on the information you get from smart cities temperatures like you know you can sell more umbrellas if you know it's going to rain <laughs> but <laughs> you know, rain sensors or where, where these things are or where to avoid or yeah logistical route planning like Live yeah. Logistic, yeah, there's, there's so much ever. There is a, yeah, it's an interesting one. Yeah. Been, there's uh, an element of forecasting in that, isn't there? Yeah. In that, um, you can't just get the umbrellas immediately, you've got to know the weather forecast a week ahead of time or a few days, you know, depending on the your supply chain. So, um, so the more data, the better in terms of predictive models. And, mm. uh, and we could go ahead on and talk about AI and how you know these things would then you could create some kind of predictive algorithm to to know when you're going to need things based on this amount of data um, and i know we've done projects to do with um trying to predict when um kind of a water company will need to send out a um like a fully loaded truck as opposed to just uh, a couple of people to try and sort out a, a blockage um based on what area it's in and what the weather's like um to, to reduce their running costs but i mean it, that's something that's already being looked at and it's all based on how much data you have available um there is a lot of opportunity and i think that's the exciting thing about the smart cities is it's there's just so much opportunity for everyone it's it yeah. seems like that everyone can benefit from it from all different angles so um yeah it's really really interesting and hopefully mm -hmm. um we see a lot more developments in the near future and that's why yeah. we go right back to the first question of trying to define what it is and we can't because there is that much opportunity and that much you know yeah it doesn't matter what industry you're in it, you can be a part of it and benefit from it so yeah you're right i think through holistic and not necessarily manufacturing but any industry that you're in like there yeah. will be some way to benefit or be involved with smart cities and, and being a part of that 
Exactly. So we've gone circular economy, full circular, <laughs> back to the beginning, nice way of tying it up. <laughs> tying it all together. <laughs> circular <laughs> conversation about a circular economy. <laughs> exactly. But no, um, unfortunately, yeah, that is all we've got time for today. Um, so I just want to say a massive thank you to both Tom and Matt for joining me today and um, taking your time and also expressing your expertise and informing us on what a smart city is. <laughs> or failing to, as it were. <laughs> You're very well. Expertise. Enjoy it. Opinions. <laughs> thank you both very much. Thank you. Thanks, Emma. Thanks, Emma. Go well. to anyone who's interested in finding out more or even getting in touch to see how we can support your business please visit www.virtualengineeringcentre.com or even send us an email at vec at liverpool.ac.uk or call 01925 864 854 thanks again and join us next time on the virtual engineering centre podcast engineering in digital